If you could take a seat. There are lots of pictures to see today, so get yourself a seat where you can see the, the front really well. And we're going to begin today with some music for centering and becoming fully present. So while the music starts, if you could double check your smartphones and other beeping devices and turn them off. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Laura McGee, and I am both your service associate and your presenter today. Um, I welcome you to this gathering hosted by the Unitarian Universalist Church of Bowling Green. Whether you are here in person or online, we are so glad that you are joining us. If you haven't done so already, please set your cell phones to silent. 
We are a welcoming congregation. Whoever you are, however you identify, wherever you come from, and whoever you love, you are welcome here. Our Sunday services are different each week so that we can honor and learn from our wide array of traditions and beliefs. I will be the speaker today, and I'll introduce myself in just a little bit. Um, though we each walk our own path here in this place, on the land of the Osage, the Cherokee, the Shawnee, and the Yuchi, and now, at this time, we journey together as one community. For Unitarian Universalists, the flaming chalice is a symbol of the light of learning and the love of our community. going to take me just a second here to find my reading. <laughs> so last summer, I took a writing course at Ghost Ranch Presbyterian Conference Center in New Mexico. It was taught by Anita Skeen, who is a writing professor in Michigan. It was an awesome course. I highly recommend it. This is a poem called Waking. The sun reaches its fingers across the floor and up the wall. I feel the golden light before I see it. Lines blurred between sleeping and waking. This life now, so full of decisions. Would you like your coffee in bed or on the porch? <clears throat> In bed, I say, and then let's go out and play. All right. So I am, have been invited today to speak to you about an artist residency in which I took part in May of this year. So. I'm very glad to be here with you today and very pleased to have been invited to talk about my experience creating art in France. And I want to thank you for being here or for coming online, if you're online. Can everybody hear me okay? Volume good? Okay. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about myself and about what moved me to choose this experience. And then we'll get on the road to France. I hope that during today's talk, you feel transported to the Champagne region of France. And perhaps you are inspired to think about the ways in which you want to learn and grow and the adventures that you would like to plan for yourself. So. Let's take off. I want to begin by showing the connection between Unitarian Universalism and my decision to take part in an artist residency. I was raised in a Protestant denomination. However, I was increasingly drawn in my lifetime to the principles of Unitarian Universalism. As you use, we draw wisdom from many spiritual traditions as represented by the symbols in our windows. Beautiful stained glass. We have seven principles that describe what we as UUs believe in common. UUism is a living faith. That means the way we phrase the principles we share may change as conditions in the world change. However, the core beliefs will remain the same. The principles as you see them here may be revised. However, this is what we have now. I love the first principle the most. 
the inherent worth and dignity of every person. For me, this means that we embrace the uniqueness and the individual talents of every person. We accept them for who they are and who they want to be. This is a reason I wanted to make space in my life to create more art. The third principle also stands out in relation to my topic today. I desire to grow and to support others in growing in so many ways. Spiritual growth is one of those. I also believe we must develop a more mature, compassionate response to our fellow human beings and to the state of the world. In UUism, you, in UUism, we are, as the fourth principle states, encouraged to seek our own truth and meaning. Every once in a while, I hear someone say that this is a denomination in which you can believe anything. Not so, in my opinion. We are free to seek the wisdom of the world's spiritual traditions within the constraints of the principles we hold in common. And so we come to my journey to find my own highest dignity and worth and to lift others up as well. This is me around age 13 or 14. Looks like a really dreamy teenager, right? When my grandmother visited, we drew and painted together. I watched as she captured the essence of a motif in many lines, shaping the image as she went. Just look at all the lines here. Both my grandmothers were artists, in fact. As a young person, I was constantly checking out library books and teaching myself new art processes. I was never happier than when I was allowed to take private art lessons. I was that nerdy kid who turned in the weirdest school projects. In health class, it was a diagram of all the parts of the human heart, batiked and labeled in full color on a square of fabric and sewn into a sofa pillow by my mother. <laughs> we used it for a long time after it earned an A. For a history class project, I researched and hand-painted a pub sign from medieval times. You can picture that in London, right? Old city pub sign. And I painted my own on an old cabinet door. I pity the teacher who might have taken that home to grade it. In the years that followed, I took Saturday workshops and short courses in art whenever I could. After a high school exchange year in Germany, I fell in love with German language and culture. I pursued all my subsequent degrees in German and taught at WKU for 25 years, spending 11 of those as head of modern languages. I'd loved every minute of it, even if it was terribly challenging at times. In the earliest years of my teaching career, I was more focused on teaching German language and culture. In later years, I began to put more value on helping students, staff, and faculty discover and pursue their talents and passions, and to believe that they can create the life they want. All the while, I lived modestly, and I saved 10%, 20%, sometimes 30% or even 40% of my paycheck. I know it makes me an odd bird. The day came when preparation met opportunity. WKU offered a buyout. That was 2021. While I have continued to love growing and helping others grow, the emphasis is different now. My life centers around art and the many other fun things that I also love to do. But today, we will talk about art. As soon as I had accepted WKU's buyout offer, I was looking for the right experience to jumpstart my art. I asked the universe to help me see it. And would you know, I saw an item on Instagram and had that awesome feeling right away. This is the right experience for me. 
It was the Chateau Orquivo Artist and Writer's Residency. I applied immediately. The pandemic delayed my participation until May of this year. And now I can take you on a journey with me to make art at the Chateau. So let's buckle up and take off. I flew to France and I spent a few days in Paris. Let me give you a secret travel tip. Don't go to Paris in May. <laughs> it's beautiful, but there's so many people. And for me, that was a little bit challenging after COVID. From Paris, I took the train about two and a half, two and a quarter hours east southeast to the town of Chalmont. So that's the red line you see there. You can see that it's not far from the German border. By the way, French trains are awesome. I mean, German ones are too, but French trains also awesome. Not always this empty, right? Can't guarantee that, but quite modern and comfortable. Don't we need something like that here? Yeah, imagine that, right? The residency participants were picked up by minivan by the staff, and we headed off through the Champagne region of France to the chateau. There were all together about 24 of us, artists, writers, and a musician, 23 women and one man. <laughs> Guys, yeah, maybe you need to put yourself out there a little more often. Yeah. So. These yellow flowers, does anyone know what they are? Canola? I think they're canola. Canola often, uh, this is probably a field, you know, that had been harvested and was just kind of growing a little bit wild. A lot of fields, absolutely full of yellow flowers, entire fields of yellow flowers. If you look carefully, you can see a windmill in the distance. We drove through the chateau gates and there, it was, just like on Instagram. <laughs> so just to give you a sense of the layout, the ground floor, lowest level that you can see there, was common rooms. The next floor had guest bedrooms. They were simply furnished in an elegant way. And the third floor contained studios. There were extensive grounds and a wonderful view of the village of Orkivo below. You ready to go inside, Chateau? Yeah? Okay. So the large entryway leads to common rooms on either side. And by the way, this book in the foreground there, every artist leaves a piece of art in this, in, in this big book, talking about, um, let's see. This one right there. And there's multiples. There's, there are multiples of them, but that is just awesome to look back and see what each artist left, left behind um, as a thank you. So the spacious salon was open all day for our use and was a gathering spot for learning sessions about the business of art and for evening social time. The central stairway led past awesome original tapestries and modern art installations. The second floor was full of guest rooms and had several bathrooms. I don't have a photo of that to show you. Just, um, and then this stairway led to the third floor where many artists had individual studios. So on the left-hand side, you can see the hallway all the way down the third floor, and every room along there is a studio, and each artist had their own studio to work in. And at the very end of the hallway is a, they called it the supply room or art cabinet. It's just where past artists left things behind, and if you just either needed something or you wanted additional inspiration or just to try something else, you could go dig through it. When I read that that was going to be part of it, I'm like, oh, I can't wait. I can't wait to see that. On the right is the room that was my studio. So take a look. That's how it looked when I first stepped in. Okay. 
And the window was the top, it was the central window on the third floor overlooking the entire landscape. So this was the center room on the top, almost the top floor. There was actually another floor with rooms, but the studio floor. Um, okay, so we also got to um, visit the cellar. Hang on a second here. Yeah, we were invited to tour the cellar as well. So that's below the main or ground level. It had a long hallway with spaces off of it like this. There was also the so-called wine cave. At 5.45 each day, the program assistant sent out an Instagram message that it was open. We could select and purchase a bottle of wine if we liked. And of course, there were plenty of champagnes because it was the champagne region. Let's take a peek. That's what it looked like inside. At, at, um, let's see. And there was also a costume room. Just in case you needed period dress for a party, photo shoot, or art prop. We had free run of the entire chateau grounds. Walking the grounds at whatever time of day was a great way to take a break from painting or gain inspiration for the next work of art. Almost wherever you were, you could hear water, whether on the chateau grounds or walking through town. It was so refreshing. I had written ahead and asked for a particularly quiet room. And I, along with several other artists, were accommodated in houses in the village. So, each day, I walked from the chateau, which is behind the point of view from which I took this photo. Um, I, I walked um, from the chateau to the village. This photo shows the stables on the left and the gatehouse where the residency hosts live. Here we have a Google Earth view of the chateau and the village. And to the right, a photo of the old stone house in which I stayed. The owner of the chateau had purchased this house and several others in the village and given them a loving restoration. Um, and I just want to, let me see if I can point. Okay. So this is the chateau. Here's the lake. You just had a little view of the lake from the south end. Here's the south gatehouse, um, the stables, and the gatehouse. And then here's the village. Okay, It's not very big. And this right here, the, the biggest road, is the main road through. And so that was this road right here. So you could say, um, I asked for a quiet room, and they put me on the main road. but. Let's look at how thick these walls are. <laughs> if you look in the top edge of the, of the picture, you can see the window there. And you can see the walls are probably more than a foot thick stone. Um, and there was not much traffic. It was really, really a nice place. Uh, the downstairs was nicely renovated, all just up to date, and a, a really pretty look to it. Uh, this house had three bedrooms, and so there were three of us, each of us with a room in this particular house. So now I want to tell you a little bit about the people that I met, both the residency staff and some of the artists themselves. Beulah Van Rensburg, artist residency director on the left, coordinated programming, presented content, and was available for individual coaching. Ziggy Atias, on the right, owns the chateau and is the founder and director of the residency. He is an artist, designer, entrepreneur, and filmmaker. I should mention that Beulah um, is an artist in her own right and is a former gallery owner, I guess probably a current gallery owner as well. Together they have developed this model as a way of stewarding this place to foster creativity and to bring the chateau alive. The residency runs year-round with the exception of a few weeks in summer and winter. 
The chateau and its programming also provide employment in an area where there were few signs of job opportunities. Beulah and Ziggy were there daily, engaging with the artists. They ran the residency, they ran the program with the support of an assistant named Karina, also an artist, she's in the middle here. For those who missed their cats, there was an energetic young tomcat who was always up to something. He was a lot of fun. The staff of cooks and groundkeeper, groundkeepers were super friendly and helpful. Let me talk now also about some of the participants. And I'm just picking out a few of them. Um, this is Maria Tuttle. She was a participant like I was. Maria is bilingual, she also speaks Spanish, and when she's at home in the United States, she runs a nonprofit that provides art opportunities for kids. I often found her outdoors painting when I went on my morning walks. I asked her about her watercolor techniques, and she was kind enough to provide guidance for me to try it also. My technique, let's see, my point is, the opportunity to exchange ideas with others really helped make the experience productive. She was kind enough to help me get started with watercolor. Um, in the left-hand photo here, you, with the short hair, you see Beulah again, um, the residency director, um, likely engaged uh, in a conversation about writing, so providing coaching and encouragement to each of the participants. I also met Kate a painter from Canada, who gave me new perspectives on color and who tutored me in social media. You might think, from seeing these photos, that we had plenty to drink and nothing to eat. <laughs> Not so. So, this was the breakfast spread each day. It started with French press coffee, of course, lots of cheeses, farm fresh eggs, and bread that arrived like clockwork at 9 a.m. daily, still warm, I might add. Every evening, the dinner bell rang at 7. The cook, in this case, Marie, and she's there in the dark clothing in the middle, uh, almost in the middle, presented the food she had prepared, naming each dish and identifying those that were sans gluten, without gluten, <laughs> for the gluten intolerant people like me. The cook was always rewarded with an enthusiastic round of applause. Doesn't that sound like a good tradition? Really neat. At meals, the conversation was about making art. At meals, the conversation about making art continued. Even over dessert. We didn't have gluten-free dessert every day, but some days we did. It was really good. I began many of my days with walks at sunrise. The simplicity of the village houses and the countryside invited me to focus on light and color, texture and composition. This little town had recycling bins, so they are taking action in support of the environment. I could choose almost any direction to walk. The cows often came to check me out as I walked by. This group of cows actually came trotting from the far corner of the field just to see what was up. Or maybe they're used to getting treats. I'm not sure. The forest ran right up to the chateau grounds. And I could explore endlessly. The green of the trees soothed my eyes. It was such a bright saturation of color, like oxygen, it filled my lungs. The color filled my eyes. You see a road like this, you just want to keep going, right? You just want to see what's next, what's around the bend. But breakfast was calling me, so, yeah. 
We gathered in the evenings after a day of art making to socialize. And then I walked back to the village. It was silent. No car, no store, only a few street lights. And even those, they turned off at 10.30 p.m. All of them. No one even had a porch light on. It was awesome. Painting each morning and afternoon, I began to bring color into my studio. The first were compositions created by spraying dye over hand-cut stencils arranged on watercolor paper. It takes several layers of arranging and spraying to complete these. I like to do them in pairs. Here are some close-ups. I actually brought these with me today. If you want to see what they actually look like, I'm prepared to show after. Um, I plan and compose these, but there's also a calculation of negative space. The color does not go where I have laid the stencil, right? That's how stencils work. It goes everywhere else but. Sometimes the result brings pleasant surprises. For instance, the overlap of color or the varied texture from the spray on the paper. Some of these, especially those with largely primary colors and basic shapes, remind me a little bit of a Bauhaus aesthetic. After a watercolor tutorial by Maria, I spent time in the village sketching and painting. The image on the right is sketched lightly in pencil, then drawn with a Sharpie, then painted with watercolor. I enjoyed simplifying motifs and taking liberties. This red thing seemed to be a water pump next to what might be the communal fish cleaning station at the village stream. Here's another motif. I really like the very paired back simplicity of the shapes of the windows and the doors and the textures of the walls. Some buildings of the village had colored doors and wisteria vines, so I decided to add them here too. This illustration style of pen with watercolor was new to me. I was experimenting. I shifted to silk painting and rendered a roadside poppy that had caught my eye on a morning walk. This one is about 30 by 30 inches. And then I took on landscapes, something I have only seldom done on silk. This was the reference image. So get ready, this one's really gonna pop on the screen and the colors in real life are more vivid than this, but just imagine, yeah. With some of the things that I learned from Maria's watercolor tutorials, I worked the colors and light in a new way. My morning walks were so inspiring. I was entranced by the natural landscape spread out before me, and I wanted to keep walking around that next bend and down that next road. On this particular morning, I reached a small side road and had stepped onto it and was considering walking down it. I hesitated because I thought, would I do this in Kentucky? Just then, a car pulled up and I thought, hmm, should I be worried? I'd be extra cautious in Kentucky. A man got out of the car and popped his trunk and beckoned to me. Horror movie plots flitted across my brain. <laughs> And he said in French, and luckily I understand enough to get what he said, I have so many fresh eggs. Here, take some and enjoy them for your breakfast. <laughs> wow, I felt relieved. I painted this place too. So that was the reference photo right here. And here comes the image that I painted. But that's just a little piece of it. The whole thing looks like this. 
That is six feet long, 14 inches high, crepe de chine silk. It's already sold, I'm sorry. Yeah. But good for me, yeah. Beulah coached me a lot. She said, you gotta sell them, you're gonna make more. Sell them, you're gonna make more. That's the way it works. Let them go. I painted more large pieces. Something put me onto butterflies. And I cut a stencil in varied sizes, restricted my palette to just four colors, and painted a pair of butterfly compositions on silk charmeuse. You see one of them right here. Charmeuse is the heaviest, most luxurious silk I use, that I use. These pieces are also six feet long and 14 inches wide. Great to wear or to hang on a wall. There are three techniques I used for painting this particular design. So this one, and you see it there in two different color sets. Um, so the techniques are stenciling with the butterfly shapes, different shapes that I drew and cut out, um, and then what's called dry line technique. That's at the bottom of the piece here where you put on the silk dye and you let it go until it simply stops. It kind of gets dry, okay? Um, and it gives that really rough edge that you see there. And then rock salt. So you can put rock salt on the wet dye um, and it kind of pushes the moisture around or pulls it around and makes a pattern as well. Okay. So I also varied the concentration of the dyes or the dilution um, of the dyes to achieve more or less intense colors. As the two weeks came to an end, it was time to transform my studio into a gallery for, for Open Studio Day. That too was fun. And I discovered that I really enjoyed placing art in the space. I arranged my gallery somewhat chronologically to represent my production, starting on the left wall. Um, starting on the left wall. I suspended the longest pieces from the slanted wall and let them move with the air currents. And I left the table set up for painting to help illustrate the tools and the process. The culminating event of the two-week residency was a day of open studio where each artist spoke about their work and the other participants could comment and give feedback. And these are just some of the various different artists and, and the group looking at their work. Um, to my surprise, that day of open studio flitted by. There was so much to see and share. Even though we had been together for two weeks, there was an immense amount to see and learn about what others had produced. This is one of the studios in the stables. You can see it's got a really rustic, kind of rough look to it. That's Karina, the assistant. I think these are inspired by walks in the woods as well. Oops. Oops. Oot, oot. If you want to see more uh, photos from that day or get a sense of what the artists produce, um, you can look at my Instagram account. Um, this is actually the QR code for it. It's Laura Green McGee is the Instagram handle, or you can go and find the Chateau Orquivo Instagram. It's where they put a lot of information. Um, this was one of the watercolors I did after Maria taught me a little bit. And um, the residency likes to have each artist give one piece for their collection, and they asked for this particular piece. So that's now in the residency collection. The residency continues as a mission to foster artistic growth, and there are special support scholarships for emerging artists. These scholarships helped the residency achieve a broad age span of participants. So for me, the artistic production continues. I feel a new interest in painting my environment. 
My experience at the residency moved me to sign up for a beginning gouache class at Ghost Ranch in New Mexico. And I will be posting images from that experience. I just came back from it. Um, I'll be posting some of those soon. So yeah, so just building on it, things as I go. That's the end of my presentation, per se. So thank you. <laughs> So at this point in the service, we will have an offertory um, because this congregation is supported by the pledges and the gifts of its members and friends. Before we do that, I want to put a little bug in your ear, in your mind, something to think about during the offertory. So, here goes. This is just for you to think about, questions to ponder. If you were a loving and supportive parent to your inner child, imagine your inner child now, and you're looking at your inner child, and you say to your inner child, today you get to do whatever you want to do. What? would your inner child like to do? They look up at you because they're a child and they say what they'd like to do. What is that thing? Something to think about. Or, phrased differently, different, different question, if you could do whatever you want to, what would it be? And if there were no limits, what would it be? Sometimes we ask that question and we're already putting limits before we've answered the question. So consider that. Um, okay, so offertory, um, last week would have been our third Sunday, and in this congregation we do a third um, Sunday offertory. That means that this congregation chooses an organization, typically in our community or in our state, to be the direct beneficiary of our gifts on the third Sunday. Um, and I'm told we didn't do it last Sunday, so we're going to do it this Sunday. Um, our plate collection today, if not labeled as a pledge, will go today to the Kentucky Unitarian Universalist Justice Action Network, also called KUJON. This is a statewide network seeking to help develop the capacity and confidence of UUs in Kentucky both congregations and individual, to engage in meaningful justice activism and to be a voice for justice statewide. Kujan believes that Unitarian Universalists are people of all ages, people of many backgrounds, and people of many beliefs. We are brave, curious, and compassionate thinkers and doers. We create spirituality and community beyond boundaries working for more justice and more love in our own lives and in the world. Kujan is also part of a larger network of UU State Action Networks. Their participants come from eight Kentucky congregations as well as three in Cincinnati. The, this organization has brought together all UU congregations to advance voting rights, fight racism and oppression of the LGBTI communities, transition to renewable energy, to prevent gun violence, and to support reproductive rights. They need help with both funding and activists. Please give generously if you are willing and able and join the cause. So we will now take up collection, or you can do it online. And we have some music.
Thank you for these gifts. May we use them wisely in the service of our congregation, our community, and Kujan. If you have questions about Unitarian Universalism or about joining this congregation, we ask that you speak to someone on the membership team. Are there membership team members here today who could raise their hands and hold them up for a minute? Yes. And, or our board president, Roxanne Spencer. Yeah, thank you. Um, or you can email the president president at uubgky.org. You can also find mo out more about us by um, reading our community news that is sent out weekly as an email update. You can look at the bulletin board uh, outside the sanctuary. You can follow us on Facebook, our YouTube channel, and you can check out our website. Okay. I think we are coming to closure here, yes. I'm going to extinguish the chalice, moment. And then we have some closing music, and this music was generously provided by Sue Horowitz, who was singer-songwriter at the residency. Um, and she wrote this song and recorded it at the chateau. So thank you, Sue, for letting us play this today. Go in peace, go in service, go in love. It's a beautiful life, make something beautiful Like a skilled artisan Or a child at play Shape and define the grand design It's a beautiful life Make something beautiful It's a beautiful life Make something beautiful From the inside out And the outside in Let it pour from your heart into It's a beautiful life, make something beautiful. It's a beautiful life, make something beautiful. The stories you weave, the canvas you paint, the songs that you sing, the gifts you bring. It's a beautiful life, make something beautiful. 
It's a beautiful life Make something beautiful It's a beautiful life Make something beautiful It's a beautiful life Make something beautiful Thank you all. Thank you for coming. Thanks.